Welcome to House of David Ministries. I'm Pastor Eric Michael Teitelman. Join me as we learn about the rich heritage of our Christian faith. In each episode, we explore a unique topic that will deepen your knowledge of Christ and who we are as His people. In this episode, we will discover God's plans for restoring His kingdom as we near the end of the age. And we will see how the church is called to be a part of God's plan of restoration. The prophet Isaiah has given us a powerful glimpse into this time. In Isaiah chapter 2, it reads, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days, these are the last days, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, of Israel. And he will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, from Jerusalem. So mountains in scripture represent kingdoms. So the key to understand here is that the mountain of the Lord's house represents Christ's kingdom and his church. And still there remains confusion within the church about what exactly is the kingdom. Now, we've discussed this in other teachings, so here's just a quick summary. The kingdom of God is not some intangible spiritual place in the clouds. No, the kingdom of God will be established right here on earth in Israel from Jerusalem. Yeshua is the king and we are his royal subjects. The Ecclesia, a congregation of people from every nation, tribe, people, and tongue. And the nations do not replace Israel, but are joined with her, and we together are the kingdom of God. And the foundations of this great kingdom is God's eternal law that was given to the Jewish people. So when exactly will the kingdom be established? Yeshua said in Mark chapter 1, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Well, this would imply that the kingdom of God is a present condition. However, in the commonly accepted premillennial view is that when Christ returns to the earth, he will at that time usher in and ultimately establish the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God is both present and future. The remnant of unsaved Israel will at that time see the one whom they have pierced and they will all come to faith in their Messiah. And until that time, Israel is still subject to God's judgment which will culminate in the Great Tribulation, the last three and a half years before Yeshua returns to the Mount of Olives. Then, in one instantaneous moment, everything gets fixed. The church comes to her senses about Israel, and Israel comes to the reality that Jesus is their God and Savior. In other words, the Christians had a right after all, and this scenario implies that the kingdom of God is a future condition. Unfortunately, this view is not entirely accurate. It is true that the return of Christ ushers in the kingdom of God in the earth and begins the 1,000-year rule of the Messiah, which is called the Millennial Kingdom. But there is much biblical prophecy that must be fulfilled before Yeshua's actual return. And the study of this prophecy is called eschatology, which is the study of the end times. Now, if you think for a moment this topic is unimportant, Yeshua sternly warned his disciples in all four of the Gospels and the Book of Revelation to be watching with eager expectation for his imminent return. And he also promised a blessing to those who were found watching when he returned. Now, Yeshua had many things to say about the kingdom, and we read that the disciples were deeply curious about the end of the age and the restoration of the kingdom. So listen to their inquisitive hearts for a moment and the answers that Yeshua gave them. They said, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. Jesus responded in Matthew 24, saying to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences and earthquakes in various places, all these things are the beginnings of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my namesake. 
and then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now these verses give us quite a bit of information about the last days. Unfortunately, the subject is considered by many to be irrelevant. But is it? The period that Yeshua describes is called by many different things, including the last days, the latter days, the time of sorrows, and the end of the age. The last days are not the end of the world, nor are they the day that Yeshua returns to the earth. That day, which is known only to the Lord, will be unique in every way, and it is called the day of the Lord. This will be the day when Yeshua physically returns to the earth. The time and season leading up to this great day should be recognized by the church as the last or the latter days. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. So are we in the last days leading up to the return of Yeshua? Well, very likely, but it's impossible to speculate just how long we have left since no man knows the day or the hour. The Lord moves at a pace that seems slow to us, and a day to Him is like a thousand years. So if we don't know exactly how long, then we should at least be aware of prophetic events unfolding in the earth during this time. Yeshua said in Matthew 24, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. We know from Scripture that the fig tree represents Israel, and here Yeshua spoke of a branch that was becoming tender and putting forth leaves. So we know that part of this tree will come back to life before the return of Yeshua. And since God gave Israel his biblical calendar, Israel is the Lord's time clock. Yeshua also revealed many signs of the end, deception, false messiahs, wars and threats of war, kingdoms rising and falling, famine, pestilence, and powerful earthquakes. But all this, he said, was just the beginning. And it gets worse. Listen carefully to these words. The Lord declared in Hebrews chapter 12, Once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Everything in this world is going to begin to fall apart. But in the midst of this chaos, there is a prophetic promise that God has made to Israel. It says in Isaiah chapter 60, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. We know this verse is about the Messiah. But if we continue reading, we see the scripture also speaks to the restoration of Israel. It says in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 4, Your son shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Now, wait a minute. I thought the Lord was done with Israel until the end of the tribulation. This is quite a different picture here than what many theologians may have taught you. As the earth falls into greater darkness, Israel will begin to rise and shine as a beacon of light in the earth. Let's go back to our opening scripture from Isaiah where it says, These things shall come to pass in the latter days, meaning the days leading up to the return of the Lord. And what things is the Lord speaking of? Well, specifically it says that the kingdom of the Lord's house, which is his holy temple, shall be established over all the kingdoms of the earth and shall be exalted over all the nations. It says that all the nations shall flow up to Jerusalem, to the kingdom of God, And Israel will teach the nations how to walk in God's paths according to his laws. We know that all who are in Christ Yeshua, both Jew and Gentile, are both the temple and the kingdom of the living God. And I am specifically referring to Messianic Jews, true Israel, and the believing Gentiles who have been grafted in amongst us. I am speaking about the Lord's church, his ecclesia, and his congregation comprised of every nation, tribe, people, and tongue. And I'm speaking about the one new man in Christ Yeshua who have been brought together by the blood of the Lamb. One people of God comprised again of every tongue, tribe, nation, and people. We are the redeemed of the Lord. 
And the branch that will come from the fig tree that Jesus spoke about is that messianic branch. Paul said in Romans 11, But through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. And he's not talking exclusively about the gift of salvation. He's also talking about the calling to share the new covenant and the message of salvation with all the nations. This calling, which was originally for Israel, has for a season been given to the Gentiles. But only until Israel's temporary blindness has been lifted and the fullness or the full number of Gentiles have come into the kingdom of God. There are two aspects of the kingdom that the Lord will work together in tandem. As the Gentiles accept Christ and provoke Israel to jealousy, Israel will gradually be awakened and restored to her spiritual foundation and begin to become a light to the nations. And Yeshua's words then will ring true, that the message of salvation would be shared in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He said in Matthew 24, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. This time of the end, the latter days, is when we would begin to see the restoration of God's kingdom. And so if we study the history of both Israel and the church, we will discover there is a common parallel, that God has been working for centuries to restore both. While they seem to be on different and even diverging paths at times, At some point not far in the future, the Lord will bring the two together as one. So let's go back in time and look at some of the history. The Jewish Enlightenment period began in the late 19th century, and this period culminated in what is called the Balfour Declaration that was approved in 1917. And ultimately, it led to the Council of the League of Nations agreeing to restore the Jewish homeland in 1922. Now, sadly, this Zionist vision would not be fully realized until after the ashes of the Holocaust, when the United Nations General Assembly would vote in 1947 to partition an area of Palestine for the Jewish people. And on May 14, 1948, a gathering of Jewish leaders in Tel Aviv signed a proclamation that declared the establishment of a Jewish state to be known as the State of Israel. Nineteen years later, June 1967, during the Six-Day War, Israel regained control of the Temple Mount for the first time in nearly 2,000 years. The Lord's prophetic words had been at least partially fulfilled as He began to restore His kingdom. And what about the church? Well, starting with the Protestant Reformation in 1517, the Lord began to restore His written word to the body of Christ. The term Reformation derives from the Latin word reformatio and means restoration or renewal. And from the 1730s to the 1800s, the Lord brought the first and second great awakenings to the church and restored the power of His Holy Spirit to His people. The third great awakening began in the 1850s and continued through the 1900s. And the crescendo of this movement is commonly referred to as the Azusa Street Revival, and it birthed the Pentecostal church that moved in great signs, wonders, miracles, and healings. And lastly, from the 1960s to the 1970s, the church experienced the fourth great awakening and the explosion of the Messianic movement. This initiated the last phase of God's restoration to the church, and that was to bring the Messianic Jewish people, that's that branch that I was talking about in the fig tree, to bring the Messianic Jewish people together with their Gentile brothers as one new man. This move of the Holy Spirit was divinely timed with the return of East Jerusalem and the Temple Mount back to the Jewish people in 1967. And so with the restoration of God's Word, the power of His Holy Spirit, and the awakening of many Jewish people back to their Messiah, the Church today is poised to receive the Lord's next great outpouring of His Spirit. This will culminate in the final restoration of the church and Israel and the greatest harvest of souls the world has ever seen. Yeshua's disciples, no doubt, had many questions for him, but one of them stands out to me in particular. In Acts chapter 1, the disciples asked, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? 
Yeshua kindly rebuked them and said that the time and the season was not for them to worry about, but that they had one immediate task at hand. That was to receive the power of the Holy Spirit from on high and to preach the message of the gospel in every nation. Now, the fact that Yeshua's disciples asked this question reveals that they understood that the kingdom of God belonged to Israel. And we, the church, should understand the same, that God is restoring his kingdom to the Jewish people and that we are part of his plan of restoration. The other noticeable point is that the gospel was to be preached through Israel from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. The clear indication here is that it will be Israel, not Rome or America or any other nation that will ultimately be stewards of God's word or stewards of God's assignment to bring and teach his word to every nation. This confirms the irrevocable calling given to the Jewish people, but again for this season has been entrusted to the Gentiles. Paul said in Romans chapter 3, What advantage then has the Jew? Or what is the profit of circumcision? Well, much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. So the church needs to be aware of God's restorative work with his land and his covenant people, Israel. And we need to get our eyes pointed in the right direction, towards Jerusalem. Because this is where the Lord will reestablish his spiritual foundation and heritage. And this is where the center of Christianity will once again return in these last days before the return of Christ. And so, it should be no surprise that the Lord has drawn so many influential Messianic leaders back to Israel over the past several decades. God is restoring his kingdom. The church has been invited to join the Lord in this great end times endeavor. But will we respond? The Lord told his disciples in Luke chapter 10, The harvest truly is great, but the labors are few. And Yeshua was also very selective about his servants. In Mark chapter 3, it says, Yeshua went up on the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted. In Matthew 22, it says, For many are called, but few are chosen. Yes, the Lord chooses those he wants, but how are we qualified to be chosen? Well, first, I believe we must be willing. The prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 6, Here am I, send me. And second, we must have the Father's heart to fulfill his will. It is imperative that we understand God's heart for Israel. The Lord declared in Jeremiah chapter 31, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. And in chapter 32, the Lord continued to speak about Israel when he said, Yes, I will rejoice over them to do them good. And I will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. Wow. It is imperative that we understand God's heart for his land and his people. A land, it says in Deuteronomy chapter 11, for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. So this is how we are qualified. We must be willing and we must have God's heart for his land and his people. And so I pray for you to read and understand the word of the Lord so that you also will be qualified and chosen to fulfill his great commission regarding Israel and the nations. Paul said in Romans 11, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The Deliverer, who is Christ, will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Amen. If you have enjoyed this teaching from House of David Ministries, make sure you subscribe to our channel and don't forget to visit our website where you can sign up for our monthly newsletter. We pray the Lord richly bless you and we look forward to having you join us again for our next episode.